Spanning the entire globe, involving hundreds of different cultures, explaining the same phenomenon by different names. The nature of the footprints, namely their remarkable consistency, their uh, biomechanical appropriateness, um, you know, those aspects that, that are, are extremely compelling. Are you ready to uncover the mysteries of Bigfoot? Join us for Squatch Con Idaho 2023. This year, we're bringing the magic directly to your screen or join us in person. Witness the world premiere of the enhanced Paul Freeman Bigfoot footage. Doug Highcheck discovered a secret within this enhanced video you'll have to see to believe. Hear from an all-star panel of Bigfoot experts like Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum, Cliff Barockman, Brian King Sharp, and Michael Freeman. But that's not all. Get exclusive online bonuses such as Bigfoot-themed wallpapers, a Bigfoot coloring book, an interactive Bigfoot quiz, Squatch Nut Field Guide, get a copy of the Freeman Bigfoot Files ebook, and more. Whether you attend in person or watch it live online, you'll be part of an unforgettable experience. Don't miss out on this unique opportunity. Secure your spot today. Squatch Con Idaho 2023. Step Hey guys. Hey everybody. Welcome to the show. I'm Tim. I'm Dana. We're glad you're here. Yeah. Glad to join us. And we're so we're so excited. We're it looks like we have like like wildfires in the Yeah, background. we got a little bit we're of little going on. Yellow here. today. It's okay. Yellow we'll, and mellow. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make it work for sure. I uh, hope everyone's doing well. You guys you guys again, I just I know we say it all the time. We just appreciate you. We love doing this. We've got an another we've got an amazing guest who joined us uh in a previous episode. Um is maybe nine or ten episodes again ago but yep. excitingly his book is ready to come out so we're gonna we're gonna talk about that in here in a second and yeah. uh yeah so why don't ahead. you tell everybody what exciting thing that you did this week oh well i i got to <laughs> hang out with with our friend um dr esteban sarmiento so uh we uh, I was working in the area where he lives, and anytime I'm in the area, I, I'll give him a ring, usually last minute, and say, "Hey, what are you doing? Do you want to hang out for dinner or something?" So, he, uh, I got to hang out with him and his mom. Oh, who's, and... she is such a doll. She's, I think, she's 94 years old, and it was so special. Aww. She was. I just, I know Dane. I, I raved about her. She's the cutest thing in the whole world. Yeah, I'm sorry, and she's out. about four foot tall, and <laughs> she's. She's she's just fun. We just had chat. It was so special that they opened their home to me and let me come in. So yeah, it was, was fun. Cool. I had a lot, we had a lot of fun. So then yeah, I talked a little bit about Bigfoot, but just kind of just had, yeah, had a good time and hung just out. Just enjoy. We make yeah. great friends here. Yeah. Uh, you know, interviewing everybody and getting to know everybody in the conferences. So it's cool to see people and mm -hmm. chit chat and hang out without yep. having like the whole Bigfoot thing. Right. right the right, Bigfoot right. thing is very cool. Yeah. <laughs> so so today. Yeah. We have the one and only Mr. Henry Franzoni coming back. Back for part due way. Yep. So, you know, when we had Henry, you know, go, you can go, but I'm not, we're not going to do a big long intro on who Henry is we, in, and he probably won't either. Uh, but just jump back to our previous episode. Uh, I think it's 32. I'm not sure, but uh, you can find uh, our interview with Henry. And at that time he, you know, he's working on his new book, but he's got exciting news because it's, it's at the printers and we can pre-order and we're going to let him talk about it. So let's bring Henry in. I'm yeah. tired of talking. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Mr. Henry, how are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you guys? Good. Welcome to the party. So yeah, so we're just glad you're here. Yeah. I'm, we're, I'm excited for the book. I already, I, I ordered my copy pre-ordered my copy, but we're, we're going to get in that later. We'll, we'll tell the audience how they can find their copy too. But um, yeah. So how are you doing? I'm really good. I uh, worked on that book for about 15 years. So it is really a relief to actually have it at the printers because <laughs> uh, I've, I've rewritten it so many times, you know, <laughs> I can't tell you. I can't tell you how many times I've rewritten it. God. So, but it's really a relief and I really feel good. Like I've, I've finally said what I want to say about Bigfoot. Uh-oh. 
that's <laughs> so that's that's kind of how it is you know so what's it so share with the i love it the title but share with the audience the title of the book failing in a cooler way why i never found bigfoot i love Isn't it that great that's... i love it what a great title do you have do we have a shot of the book of the book cover yeah we'll, we'll bring it in I can, oh, okay. I can bring it yeah. in now Actually, here oh. I'll show you the proof from the printer. Yeah, yeah, there it is. Okay. Wow. Although it wow, has rubber bands, gushy. it's not bound. And uh, oh, oh yes, mm, there we go. Yeah, Smith, and you got rubber you? bands on it. Well, that's because it. Yeah, it's all <laughs> loose pages. This is right. the print proof that I actually oh. had. To, oh, okay. Cool. Well, yeah, well, I think Tim has like a like a like an image of it that we're going to pull up. Yeah, we'll pull up yeah. with, mm -hmm. with Henry's website and how to order the book. Yeah. So actually, now that you showed the book, uh, I'm going to kind of flip my questions with you. Let's talk about the cover of the book. So yes, a great cover. Um, I worked with Timothy Wayne Williams, and he's a great painter. And we talked about it. You know, I gave him my ideas, and I gave him a draft, a late draft of the book, which was pretty hard to read I think poor guy but um he encapsulated the themes of my book really greatly in one image and I I just think it's great you know like what a what a great job he did yeah Fantastic. we actually have a painting of Timothy's here in the house and just in case not everybody knows um, Timothy is like that artist that does like the little hidden Bigfoot series. Mm -hmm. So like if you're at a conference or, you know, your Facebook friends with him, you can see all the stuff that he's doing. Um, he also does these great calendars. Mm -hmm. um, so because a lot of people probably remember seeing his stuff, but don't necessarily remember his name. Right. So um, our painting, Henry, is, you know, if you look at the painting, you'll just you would think it's kind of just a normal painting, a beautiful painting. But then inside of there, there's a little Bigfoot in the background. You got to find it. So, uh, yeah, right. yeah. Mine, there, there's kind of a very visible Bigfoot in it. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. No, I. You know, the cover is really nice, and um, it's hard for me to uh, tell you all of what the book's about because I cover quite a lot of ground. You will see those of you who read it, but. The basic idea, the basic premise, the basic argument I'll make is that um, right now we have a biological framework for science that exists right now. And like the Linnaeus taxonomy and DNA and all kinds of existing ways that we think about flesh and blood animals and how animals eat food and predators and prey and the gnashing of teeth and the bloodbath of nature. And, and also we have another scientific framework, that one of physics, where a physicist, physicist looks out there and he doesn't see that bloodbath of predator and prey. He sees empty space, 99% empty space and 1% of something we don't understand. And that's what he sees. And now he's a valid scientist. He's a valid scientist. And a biologist is a valid scientist also. And yet their two frameworks do not fit together very well. How could it be that right now we're at a point with science as we know it today where the Nobel Prize has recently been awarded to physicists that have proven that nothing is there until you look at it. And they have now taken a theory and proven it and confirmed it with experimental data. So nothing is there until you look at it. That's how the world really works. And science as we know it today says that. So how do you square that with animals and flesh and blood? How can an animal exist when you're not looking at it? How does it actually continuously exist? How do you continuously exist if nothing's there until you look at it? How do you square these two scientific frameworks? So that's a large part of what the first part of my book's about is how to put those two together. And the way that I found is by modifying general relativity of Einstein's theory. And I go into 
explaining how I do that. And I hope to, let's say I walk a fine line where I don't want to get too detailed and scare the hell out of everybody with math, but I got to explain the concepts. So I try to stay at the 30,000 foot view and just try to give you the concepts. And I hope my goal is that by showing you all the facts, it will form a poem in your mind. And if you think about what I'm saying while you read it, this poem in your mind will help you understand what the heck's going on. So, yeah, that's kind of what I'm trying to do. And we'll see if I get there. But um, that's that's actually the starting point, okay? So I want to ask you, though, about that. So, so someone like me who may not be uh, math driven <laughs> at times, I'll be able to still, you know, conceptualize it because you're giving the 30,000. Yeah, 000 no, what, what I did was I put all – the, first, the the poor thing that Timothy read had math all over it. I, I was like, oh, my God. So then I said, oh, my God, nobody's going to read this thing. So I put all the math in the footnotes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, just put, like, the concepts back and made it readable. Like, I kept rewriting it until I was like, okay, a regular person could now read this without, you know, puking. So right. um, that's that was my goal. But... Yeah, I have to explain it because it's part of what needs to be explained. If you want to understand Bigfoot, you have to understand this stuff. I'm sorry it's not simpler, but that's the way I see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there, there's definitely no simple way to explain that phenomenon. But so, you know, just also, too, just in case um, our viewers didn't see you at the last episode, can you just, like, give them, like, a brief, like, you know, little synop synop synopsis, thank mm -hmm. you, of who you are and how you're involved in the phenomenon of Bigfoot and your thoughts. Absolutely. I realize that I am the OG Bigfooter. Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> I might be the OG Bigfooter that's left alive, but I think there's a couple others as old as me. Um, I started in 1993 and i was one of the founders of this entire thing you do today and i it came out of my mind i know that's hard to believe but once upon a time i said you know what a really great idea would be to make bigfoot websites and get bigfoot discussion groups and everybody could share pictures and stories and videos, and they could argue about Bigfoot in an online discussion group. What a great idea. So <laughs> I actually um, did that, and I showed Matt Moneymaker how to do that. And I showed, you wouldn't believe the list of people that I showed how to do that, but it's quite a list. And people, Cliff Barrickman started on my list. Also, I mean, many, many, many of your heroes today started on my Bigfoot list. Yeah, well, your Bigfoot so, list was was a forum that was the first of its kind. You were the very yeah, first one. Yeah, I, I came up with together. the idea. I was yeah. the one that said, hey, what a great idea. You know, so like I'm that weird. I was the computer freak, really. Not a Bigfoot guy at all, but a computer freak. And I was like, oh, man, you know, look at the web and look what, look what we can do now. And wow, we got to do Bigfoot there. And I was really into all the four horsemen of Sasquatchery. They were all my friends. So I worked for Peter and Renee. And I got to know Grover and John Green and... I hung out with those four guys quite a bit because I was, you know, they were my heroes, right? You know, they were so like. So you were like the fifth horseman. Well, now I am because I'm, I'm the one left alive. Well, Peter's oh, on Peter. his, yeah. Peter's actually, well, he's actually um, resting comfortably post hospice in hospice. So Peter's got very little time left. Peter's Aww. near the end. But um, yeah. They, um, I, I was their mascot. Well, I, 
see i'm the second generation that's what i am mm -hmm. in the bigfoot things like i'm i came right after them and i said wow peter i went to work for peter's bigfoot research project in 93 i was on the board of advisors for his project and we paid patty patterson twenty thousand dollars and we paid renee de hendon twenty thousand dollars to copy the patterson film and for the rights to the still photos of the patterson film that de hendon held and we did an analysis of the patterson film as all good bigfooters do to figure out what camp they're in they have to analyze the patterson film and so we did our analysis and we spent five hundred thousand dollars trying to prove it was a guy in a gorilla suit we hired real scientists from real universities to come in and prove it was a hoax and they could not prove it was a hoax so we sort of did the back end of it not what you're all trying to do now which is prove it's bigfoot we tried to prove the opposite and so we failed we did not convincingly prove that it was a hoax, which we thought suggested that it was real. Okay. That was our early step in real science. That paper was published in 1998. Okay. I have to say in 2023 that I don't see the entire Bigfoot community advancing very far past that paper. I'm sorry to say, you know, for all of the science that has gone on since, I don't see very much progress. And I think that paper stands for what I'm saying. I mean, if you read it, you'll see what I'm talking about. Like, no one's learned much else. Yeah, we, we that, hear that. You know? mm -hmm. Actually, you know? I think, is it, is it, so Henry got the first copy of my, my pre-questions for the book. Yeah. And I think that's one of the questions, but I can't remember, Henry is, so, he was, one of the answers he said, he said, that's a stupid question. <laughs> I laughed. I don't know if you remember that. Hey, I saw it. I read it. I said, I, yeah. so, no, this, well, yeah. So I can't that's, remember what question it was, but I just, it just, it just, I just, yeah, I, I am. Um, yeah. There's certain things where, yeah, I have to say, I've, I, I've heard certain questions for 30 years and, it gets old, right? You know, you go, what? Wait, wait a minute. Can't somebody answer that finally, please? I probably please. won't print that in a book, but maybe I will be kind of funny, <laughs> but I don't want someone to take it the wrong way. <laughs> yeah, I don't want people to take this the wrong way, but it's frustrating sometimes. And, and, and I honestly don't pay attention to what other people are doing and don't criticize them. I don't really want to criticize anybody else. Actually, I think everybody's partially right. That's what I think about when I see all the Bigfooters out there today, I go, God, everybody's got a piece of the puzzle. They all, in my opinion, humble mm -hmm. opinion, but mm -hmm. I should add very humble opinion, mm -hmm. but I think everybody's got a piece of the puzzle. And also I think everybody's got like something wrong, you know, like I'm like, well, you know, it's sort of a mixed bag. Everybody's half right and half wrong, but um, you know, it's really, it's really, kind of uh that's where i come from i was sort of the well a good way to put it is john green and i used to argue about who ruined bigfoot and he said i made all these new bigfoot researchers by bringing bigfoot to the internet and there's a new Bigfoot researcher minted every 10 minutes now, <laughs> and they're just flooding the world. And it's all my fault. And I said, no, it's your fault because you wrote Apes Among Us. And that's what got me hooked. Mm -hmm. And I like it captured my imagination. And I raced out and created a database of Bigfoot sighting reports like the next week, you know. So, <laughs> I mean, I mean, John Green, like, he was God, as far as I was concerned, for a while. So um, I just thought it was funny that we used to argue about that because clearly there are more Bigfoot researchers than I ever dreamed of. You know, back when I started, really, there were about 
a dozen of us. <laughs> so, so to yeah, see what's happened is really incredible. We were talking to Diane Stocking about when she was on the forum, your forum, and just she just she went through the the, the the small list of the folks that started off on the forum, and of course, then it grew. But right, uh, so that's interesting. So I want to ask you, Henry, uh, and then we'll talk about the second half of the book. So I'm assuming part of your inspiration and your experience with your first two books impacted this book. Is that accurate? Um, yeah, it's, my story's a little strange. Um, it wasn't okay for me to write this book till now. Now is okay. Before now, it wasn't okay. So I couldn't write it. And, um, at least that's what I thought. I thought so, right? What wasn't okay? I... Well, I tell the story in the book, my story about my Bigfoot quest, which is not like your guys. I didn't go down the same road you did. I smacked into the CIA stopping me immediately within by the year 2000, the U.S. government waved me off and basically told me to take a chill pill and relax and, you know, let it go. Did they come to your house? Did they call you? It's in my book. I detail okay. everything that happened yeah. in my book. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I mean, really, I go through it all. Cliffhanger. I mean, yeah. no, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. I think I remember. You know, we didn't there's a couple of them. Okay, yeah, there's, well, that's there's really a couple of incidents, right? Yeah, I know. Because all you big fitters are thinking, oh, the, big, the government's not involved. I'm like, not me. <laughs> I'm with you, okay. Henry. I've been well, with you. Yeah. Let me tell I you agree. a story. Okay, that's let me probably tell you a story. one of the biggest reasons why we haven't actually found a live one or a dead one. That's oh, my yeah. opinion. Oh, gee, yes. Well, here's 1995. I tell this story in my book. Bigfoot Research Project, we decide we're going to build a Bigfoot detector and we're going to build it and build Bull Run on Mount Hood. And we set up this huge thing where we go and we buy army surplus troop movement detectors that you bury underground and you can calibrate them for how many pounds triggers them. And we set them for 300 pounds and we put a circle in a clearing in the middle of Bill Run. And these things, if you trigger them, they would transmit a signal to a camera that was in a pod in a tree. And that camera would then turn on for two minutes and it would photograph the clearing and it would transmit because this is 1995 pre-internet really or really, really early internet. <clears throat> Maybe two years the internet existed, so we didn't have it. So we used a 2.5 gigahertz microwave transmission band and we set up antennas and we had a 15 mile link that went to Hood River, Oregon. And we had two seven mile segments, line of sight and a repeater tower in the middle. And Jeff Glickman built this whole thing. We set this whole thing up so we could sit in our office in Hood River with a VCR and this thing would wake up and do two minutes of video and record on our VCR whenever it was triggered, right? And so we went through this whole song and dance with US Forest Service setting up the deal because Bull Run is a watershed and this area is where no people are allowed. So we thought, wow, this is great, you mm -hmm. know? And there were two guys, there was an old guy and a young guy and the old guy just gave us a hard time. He's like, oh, you're wasting money, wasting your time, you idiots, you fools. <laughs> and the young kid was like, wow, no, I think he's real. Bigfoot really exists. Yeah, yeah, wow. You know, and so we were like, okay, great. So anyhow, we get ready to turn this thing on. We have spent $250,000 building this thing. And a guy from this who has CIA credentials 
And remember, the CIA, at least at that time, did not operate within the domestic United States, shows up at the door of the Hood River office and talks to Glickman. And he says, what are you guys doing? And Glickman and figures, like we all figure, you know, gee, we must have got on the government's radar because we bought those troop movement detectors, you know. <laughs> We're thinking, yeah, that's a little, little Weird, you know, yeah. iffy. What are we doing, right? So... <laughs> Glickman explains the whole thing. We explain the whole thing, what we're doing, harmless us. We're crazy Bigfoot people, you know, and we're going to turn it on the next day, except mysteriously that night, the entire thing gets fused together by a giant bolt of electricity. Hmm. Hmm. Isn't that mysterious? Right. And so everybody goes, well, gee, you must've got hit by lightning. And, um, there was no storm or lightning storm or anything that night, you know, by the way. And uh, we're like, oh, gee, that's pretty coincidental, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So we had it insured. So we did rebuild it. Jim Glickman rebuilt it. I was getting coffee. But we rebuilt <laughs> it and we redeployed it six months later. And we deployed it for two years and we never saw one thing except people riding by on motorcycles <laughs> and people walking by and in this area where there were no people that we saw people right you know like so but that's never weird. saw a big front right so so that's weird that's part a of the story part b takes place like 25 years later where vaughn hughes of the bfro sends me an email one day and he goes hey I think this was meant for you. And reading between the lines, it looks like it's the old guy that we cut the deal with. And he thinks the BFRO is the old BRP, my old group that preceded the oh. BRP. Mm. And so he's like, oh, you assholes, you know, you were such fools. You know, you wasted all that money. Everybody knows they're next to Pond One on the north side of Tiger Creek. And I'm like, <laughs> you asshole. You know, like, really, I'm sorry. That was 250 grand of somebody else's money. Okay. Right. But I felt pretty bad about, you know, blowing 250 grand. And when I thought about it, I realized, okay, so U.S. Forest Service knows about it. You know, like, hey, you know, like big shock. And obviously, like, somebody stopped us, you know, like somebody slowed us down. Somebody sent us a message and mm -hmm. I got that message, you know, like that was the first time I said, okay, the government seems to actually be slowing me down and stopping me. Hmm. Now, after 1995, when all the modern people came along, everybody's like, Oh, gee, is the government involved? I'm like, <laughs> but you have to understand by the time 2000 came around, I wasn't going to tell you that. I wasn't going to tell anybody anything. So, yeah, because I had more run. I had a bigger run in with the government later. And the second one was where I said, OK, no more Bigfoot for me. And that was 2000. 2000s when I said, OK, I got the message. I ain't going to pursue this anymore. But I didn't get the I didn't get the. Um, don't ever do this message. I got the message I got was you're pushing too hard. In your lifetime, you will know. That's the message I got. So it was hmm. like, relax. I got the message of relax. So not the message of, you know, you're, no, it wasn't a scary message. Okay? okay. I got a, I got a less scary message, which was slow down and relax in your lifetime. You'll know. And hmm. I was like, that's a nice way to get told off by the government. Okay. okay. But I got told off by the government. So, okay. So that's why my, so in 2008, when I wrote a book, I, really was worried. I was really, really anxious because I was like, what can I say? What can I not say? 
I can't say shit. I can't say anything. Wait, wait, maybe no. And I was hoping for the government to give me some kind of green light, you know, but that never happened. And so I was like, wow. So I wrote a really, um, that 2008 book, I don't tell you crap. I hold everything back. I tell you some things, but I really keep most of it to myself. Now I got a message from the government that it was okay to talk. So now I can talk. Hmm. That's so, that's so they said that you would find out in your lifetime. And it's, I guess, and how old I are guess you that's having? coming up. I'm 66. So oh, we're young. Yeah, we got, you you got we're running out of time, man. I'm no, like, hey, no. What do we got? Another 25 years, maybe, you know, like, that's I'm like, okay. Good, you know, that would be a pretty I'm like good thinking, life. I'm thinking, okay, like maybe 20 more, 25, you know, I'm like going, hey, uh, come on, solve the mystery for me, please. Give me the answer, <laughs> will you? Come on, come on, you guys. I want to know the answer, you know, so. Um, we yeah, all the, do, uh, we all do. <laughs> yeah, I know we do all, I know this about us, because I'm, as, I'm as baffled as anyone, and I've been as baffled as anyone for a really long time, you know, and it's just gotten worse because over time, as I've learned more and more and more, <laughs> I'm sorry to say more and more and more doesn't add up, you know, that's kind of how it goes for a really long time. And I don't know about you guys, but for me, <sighs> The only way I got to where I'm at now is I had to run everything down until it was a dead end. You know, I had to, I had to flog the Patterson film to death until I spent $500,000 of other people's money with our team only to find out that at the end, I was like, gee, is it a hoax or not? I don't know. Um, you know, that's kind of like a lesson where you go, well, science as we know it today cannot remove the uncertainty from the Patterson film. In the end, your judgment is going to be a balance of probabilities and uncertainties. And perhaps science in the future, we will be able to get a more definite indication from that film. But I think at the present level of technology, we can't do it. So, you know, I'm like, let it go. You got to move on after you hit the dead end of, okay, we're at the dead end. We've done everything we can think of and spend all the money we can and analyze everything we can. And let's, let's go to the next thing because we just can't remove, we can't get it smaller than a, you know, a balance of probabilities really. And that's, that's the way it is <laughs> at this time, in my opinion. Right. So, so Henry, but, can you give our viewers um, an example of why your approach to the phenomenon um, may be a little different than others in regards to your your um, your feeling on how important physics is in this subject? The thing you're looking for, the people well, let's switch to the tribal view for a moment to shed some light on that. The people before, the elliptilicum, as they're called in Klickitat, or the Siatko, or the Celetics, as Fred Beck called them back in 1924. Um, but there's got a million names, the ancient people, the animal people. Well... Western civilization, public mass Western civilization, they didn't go away. In fact, they run this geometry of space time. A tribe of giant, invisible, telepathic, teleportational, shape shifting Indians runs the world. Bigfoot rules the world. You guys don't know that yet, but you'll figure it out, I expect. That's my personal expectation. That's a little tough for most people to take right now, given the level of Bigfoot research that I see out there today. So to get from this to that, believe me, it takes physics because you have to understand 
how they live outside this geometry of space time and how they manipulate this geometry of space time because yet yeah, they're shapeshifters, sure enough, and they're even beyond shapeshifters in terms of their mental powers. And our government knows about this. And our government, in my opinion, is about to come clean and be more open about it. And all the stuff you see in the news right now with all the UFOs, why even yesterday in Congress, there was a whistleblower talking about biological material on UFOs. What a shock. Mm -hmm. All of this information is coming out all over the place. And I think it's a concerted effort. I'm guessing. And so, yeah, soon I think everyone will come to understand that, yeah, Bigfoot actually rules this world and we are the caretakers. They are the brains. We are not actually as evolved as they are surprisingly enough we're always thinking oh gee they're kind of half ape no it's the other way around guys so i've got my work cut out for me if i'm actually gonna like present this information to the bigfoot community but that's where i i have my book and my book is basically an attempt to persuade you of this <laughs> i love it so i love it and mm -hmm. and henry the <laughs> because in, in native lore, it's, you know, they talk about things like that all the time. And right. And almost every tribe. So they, the they tribes talk. know that Indians run this geometry of space time, or at least I shouldn't say that blatantly. That's a stupid thing to say. There are people within all the tribes, all the tribes seem to have elders that know and people that know that in terms of what is Indian medicine, what is Indian medicine? Well, at one of the deepest levels of Indian medicine, Indians run this geometry of space-time. They run this world. That's one of the deepest things they know that Western civilization doesn't know. But indigenous people know this all over. And before we get carried away about, oh, they're Indians, no. What I realize is we're really talking about the creator. And the creator shows a different face to everyone. And so if you're Chinese, perhaps you see a Chinese thing. If you're white, perhaps you see Jesus. I mean, there can be many faces that the creator shows you. The one I see is tribal because where I'm part Indian, apparently uh, my soul is uh, oriented towards tribal things. And so when I confront the uh, higher forces, I run into a tribal face. I don't know if that happens to everybody, but that's what happens to me. So I think they're all Indians. Christians may disagree with me on that. Yeah, I can imagine. Well, right. I'm, I mean, there are a lot of different religions and spiritualities that, you know, don't agree with each other. So that would make sense. So can we, so, so do you want to touch base on the second half of the book? Or I think you just kind of already did, right? With, <laughs> well, with, we're, we're, yeah. I mean, yeah. like I said, there's really, uh, you'll see my, um, my style is statistical density. Um, I, I'm a recording artist and I recorded a lot of new music, avant garde music. That's, kind of my thing and so there's a lot of new information in this book that you have not seen before and i feel a little guilty about that but yeah we've touched on the second half for sure and there's really a you know the basic flow of the book is i i try to simplify the physics enough to explain to you how it works and what is going on because what these physicists have recently proven experimentally is that local reality is false it's called false local reality in physics terms and it means that the world we are living in is false this is not the world we live in we think it is but it ain't and so this is actually how, this is the basis of how you combine the paranormal with 
the scientific, what I call the right brain with the left brain, because a lot of people get to the answers with Bigfoot with their intuition and they go, Ooh, I just know what's going on because my intuition tells mm -hmm. me. And those, some of those people are dead on in my opinion. It just takes dragging the left brain there where it has to go. I need all the math and physics and science and rah, 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 rah. and then when it understands too, which is what I try to do in my book is to go, look, what you think is paranormal is actually explainable in terms of physics, pure physics and math, and is not paranormal. You just don't understand the science and you don't understand the physics. Do so I help, try to explain I'm the sorry, physics. Do you help your readers understand that? Because that is like, yes. that's hard yes. to just listen to you say. So, okay, so. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Real. I'm trying to scare everybody. No, I, I really that, try to the just explain that. Right. <laughs> it's really simple in that. Like, I can give you some of the simple ideas. It's kind of like the way out of the universe is small. The, the universe does not have a zero. This world you live in right now, there is no zero. There is something at the very, very small end called the Planck length. The Planck length is the smallest thing in the universe. Below that length uncertainty makes it so that the uncertainty is larger than the distance so you can't see anything below the plank length because it's the smallest thing you can possibly possibly see or possibly measure and it's not zero that's the key it's not zero so mm -hmm. there's something under the plank length and we know from all that quantum mechanic crap that you know others talk about that um there's all kinds of virtual particles and there's all kinds of things going on there but below that you see what's what's really really below the plank length what i basically show you is that if you just tweak einstein one little bit in a way that i think he knew it would be tweaked it's a faster than light universe that lays on the other side of the Planck length. So when you get down really, really close to zero in our universe, it's faster than light. It's not like the rest of the place. Like we're in a bottle and just outside of the bottle is faster than light. And we can reach that. And actually um, Bigfoot lives there as it turns out, they live in the faster than light outside as well as inside this particular bottle that we live in. So, oh, so we live in the bottle. Mm -hmm. We and live in the bottle. And right. we're under or above the plank line. Well, I think of them as the boys top side. We're like inside the bottle. They're outside the bottle. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a really, and it, and it happens when you go way, way small, way, 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 way small. And so when you get way, 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 way down there, you get to something, you get, say that energy, which also has a wavelength. And so the wavelength can get that small too. It's not just matter that we're talking about that gets really tiny, like the plaque length, it's energy radiation because it has a wavelength and so when you squish the wavelength of energy down below that Planck length it leaves the universe it leaves our geometry of space-time it goes outside of it so we have developed we being the black projects of the United States of America in my humble opinion have been working on this technology for a hundred years and they have no doubt gotten to a point where they're so far down the road with it that a bozo like me can come out in public and talk about it and it's no threat to anybody because it's just totally obsolete information as far as they're concerned i'm just like a joke entertainment for you guys you know but the thing is is that um 
that technology, which really, uh, or let's just say that reality, that energy can get that small. When energy gets that small, the next thing that happens is there's this physics principle called the Schwinger effect. And what that is, is when you get the energy density high enough, when you get it, and I hate to do this, 10 to the 33 watts per cubic centimeter of electric, uh, well, 10, yeah, 10 to the 33 watts per cubic centimeter. No, I got that wrong. 10 to the 33 watts per square centimeter, 10 to the 18 watts per cubic centimeter. Excuse me. I hate the, yeah, I don't do there's much not, of that. There's not, Henry, there's not a quiz, right? Henry, you could yeah, like right. totally say any number you want and we would have a Right, I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, I'm okay. just competing with myself because yeah. I'm going, no, no, don't remember the wrong number. You're not going to get fact checked. No. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna, wait, am I going to pop, pop quiz? Am I, you know? Yeah. But anyhow. <laughs> The, uh, the thing is, when you get the energy, when you get an energy density high enough, actual particles come out of it. Electrons and protons and neutrons actually get created from the fields. In other words, you get the energy dense enough, matter is created. Matter comes out of like a middle of a neutron star. It's so energy dense in the center of a neutron star. It actually creates matter. So... What I'm pointing out in my simplistic physics uh, presentation here is that when you get super small, you get faster than light. And when you get this energy that's faster than light with a super small wavelength down in the micro, <laughs> tiny little thing, you're creating matter all the time. And this super force, as I call it, actually, as Dr. Salvatore Payas calls it, um, is creating the universe all the time. The faster than light shell around our universe is constantly creating this false local reality every microsecond. And so you're basically living in a film where the distribution of matter, energy, and momentum is being recreated every, you know, one millisecond. And again and again and again, like a frame rate in a movie. And it's from the outside of the geometry of space time that this incredible energy that surrounds us is pushing in. And as it pushes in, it creates matter. And Newton's third law, which is everything has an equal and opposite reaction. When you create matter and shove it into the geometry of space-time, gravity is the geometry of space-time pushing back at it. So it pushes back at the center of mass that just got created in the geometry of space-time. And that's really what Einstein's field equations say, but they're not interpreted that way. I interpret them that way, showing how to algebraically modify them with a simple multiplication by one constant. And then I show, look, look, you can do this and that and that. Now, um, the thing is, is that uh, Bigfoot, we do this with technology. We have machines. Yes, this is how you do faster than light travel. This is how warp drive actually works. Okay, guys? In a Bigfoot book, I'm actually explaining freaking right. warp, warp drive. But the thing is, is that... Um, Bigfoot does it with their mind, okay? They don't need no stinking machines to do this. Their mind, their DNA, they are so advanced compared to us that this technology is in their DNA. And so that's kind of like how advanced they are compared to us. There are elder brothers, also something the tribes will always tell you. There are elders. They're like our elder brothers and sisters. There are helpers. They're here to help us. And they're here to help us evolve and actually, you know, be better little creatures in the eyes of the creator. You know, they're not, well, the ones I know are. I mean, I right. I fully imagine from all the stories I hear that there's some bad dudes out there. But 
I've never met those. I seem to always meet the really kind, nice ones. So, so, uh, so you're trying to say that Bigfoot is here to help us? Yeah. Or that, uh, okay, that he's here or they are here to help us. Well, we're like their children. See, okay. they're the people before. They're, we're all, at some point, every person in the world is descended from someone who was tribal. We're all descended from tribal people at some point in our pedigree, you know, way, who knows how many generations. There's a tribe from which all other tribes are descended, and they're not necessarily uh, homo sapiens, but they seem to be what we call Bigfoot. This is the tribe from which all of us are descended. They seem to be native from here. They seem to be always have been here, according to the tribes, and the tribes have been interacting with them for millennia. See, Western civilization, we're the idiots out of the loop. Every indigenous person and tribe on the planet has been interacting with these guys for millennia. And so we are the stupid ones here on the planet. You know, that's really how it goes down. Sorry to say. And so, so, every, oh, go, go ahead. so yeah, so basically everybody can like get more into detail with this in your book. And, yeah, a lot more detail. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. And your, yeah. your encounters, because you just mentioned that you. Yes, I have to. You know, like Because, yeah, because that's the thing is that, um, yeah, I have to bring up like, I know that. Well, as I tried, as I've come, as. Yeah, let me start over again. <laughs> um, so, like, I'm coming out of the cave and re-engaging with everybody. And as I did that, I realized, God, everybody really likes stories. And they like those paranormal stories. And I was like, well, I got a freaking carload of them. So, <laughs> 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 I, so, yeah, I put, like, a good 10 in there so that people would of you know and that was also part of my problem was this is being an og bigfooter i i put in other stories of other people you know like like everybody else for a lot of what i learned in the beginning was i read every story that i could possibly read every setting report and i thought about every single one of them just you know and you always wonder who to believe and who doesn't believe and, you know, who's credible, what's not credible. And so I developed my whole way of picking and choosing. And I found just a handful of people, mostly my personal friends, whose stories I would believe, you know, like there was only like five, ten people. I was like, well, I believe that guy, you know. That's it. You know, everybody else I was like, well, I don't know. They're, eh, you know, so, so um, I, so I have a couple of those in there from my, from my personal, you know, favorite. Um, but mostly I just put my stories in there because I realize now I've got like, I don't know, I'm in the like 25, 30. I mean, I'm in the, I lost count range of Bigfoot interactions. <laughs> That's where I'm at. Like I actually, yeah, I have, I have no idea anymore. I have no clue how many times I've had some kind of interaction with them. You going to share, you going to show everybody what the book cover looks I, like. I'm going to, are you trying to find it? I'm going to get, Oh, there it is. I'm going to get over. Henry's got an amazing website, which I Ooh, love. Oh, that is a great. Let me share this on the screen. So for the audience who's listening, uh, we'll tell you, you know, verbally how to find it. But if you, if you, you know what, if you just type in Henry Franzoni, um, Book, yeah, you should you'll find it. You should find me. Yeah. But so that, Bill DeBuzz, um, actually, yes, my my um website is henrockflamzoni.com because <laughs> I uh you know I'm a drummer. I am I don't want so anyone to forget. The, oh, there's really the cover of the book, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. Hey, why don't you click on oh, okay, you're gonna click on that one first? It should show you a big one if it if it uh yeah i'll see if i've done this right add to cart 
There we go. Everyone can see it. It's not that large, but it's. Yeah, it's uh, pretty. It's a good size. I think you can read it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Why'd yeah. you click it off, baby? I, I, it's not purposely. So. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a. So, yeah, I'm going to just throw my theory out there in the Bigfoot world for everybody to jump on and rip apart. You know, I'm like, yay, let's go. It's um, definitely a different theory. Right. It's a it's different theory. Unique. It's not one you've heard. I know that. Yeah. I know it's not one you heard lately. And guess and, uh, what? Until we know for sure, you know what I'm saying? It's, well, yeah. it's good to have all those puzzle pieces like you were saying, for sure. And also, I mean, if we're really going to be in the spirit of science and scientific inquiry, it'd be great if I'm proved wrong, just as great as if I'm proved right. So, yep. you know, absolutely. Either I mean, way, yep. either way, it's a win, right? You know, do their due diligence, science. you know? Yeah. What do they right. say? It's yeah. not the destination, it's the journey. Well, I don't know. In this case, it might be the destination. <laughs> 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 so Henry is so the best place. So your website's the best place for for folks to buy the book. If they just go to your website. Yeah, right now because I'm just going. You know, I'm doing the uh, di. I came up through the punk and avant garde music scene and kooky Bigfoot scene. So yeah, I'm doing it DIY. I'm doing it all myself right now, and we'll see. You know where it goes. You place your bets and you take your chances. And I printed two hundred of them, and I'm. Wondering if I'll break even, you know, it's, uh, it's the usual, uh, oh my God, will anybody like my book? You know, <laughs> well, I can definitely <laughs> yeah. say that. I don't know if like Bigfoot is the way to make money. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. I learned yeah. that actually with the last book, I learned that one. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, that was, uh, <laughs> yeah, I had dreams. I had like big dreams of a, of, you know, a big seller when I wrote my yes, first he, Bigfoot book. I, I already <laughs> knew. I went in with the expectation thinking and I did yeah. it just because I was gonna wanted to do it. So yeah. so are you gonna um are you gonna be out at any of the conferences? Are you gonna go out and promote the book anywhere? Uh, I, personally where you can autograph it and I would expect meet you? I would expect so, but um yeah so far I think um you know nobody really has a bead on me yet and they don't really um, know what I have to say and we'll see how it goes out because I'd love to but the um, over the years you know I uh, like Don Keating take Don Keating you know legendary Ohio guy right so I knew Don Keating forever and ever and ever and we would talk about hey come out maybe next year I'll have you over and he gave me then maybe next year, like maybe 10 years in a row, you know? <laughs> so um, I kind of like said, all right, you know, so much for that. You know, I'm, I, I used to be a little more um, less settled in my point of view. And I was, uh, well, you know, when I left this thing in 2000, when I said, you know, heck with, that I basically now explain why finally um, I was really tired of defending the paranormal people because I am a scientist and I actually looked at the paranormal people as science we don't understand and not, you know, kooks, right? So I don't look at it like like most people and um just that would you know i often found myself defending the paranormal when i went to the 1998 university of british columbia bigfoot conference with green and de hinden and grover krantz everybody was there burn um they had a panel discussion on stage paranormal versus flesh and blood 1998 right and all the paranormal people insisted that i get on their side of the stage there was actually an issue which side of the stage should i be on and 
then when I was on their side of the stage, I had to do all the talking and I had to do all the debating. And I was like, hey, wait a minute. I don't want to be on your side defending you guys. <laughs> you know, like, That's amazing. Wait a minute. You know, but um, the thing is, is that I can see why that happened because people lump me in with the right. standard yeah. run of the mill paranormal guys. They're always like, oh man, you know, he bit the dust. He's like a paranormal guy. And I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> Physical versus non-physical. That's what we're talking about. Left brain and right brain. We're not talking paranormal. No, no. I don't like to use that frame of reference. I don't like to frame things like that, right? right. And I didn't like to frame things like that in 98, but I was forced into that frame in 98. And I'm hoping now people seem a lot more open now. And I don't think they're going to insist on, you know, lumping me in one way you know i i hope they can see that i'm a little different than both camps i kind I, of I see it kind of camp. like in your explanation when you were saying like it's just another piece of the puzzle yeah it's all you, don't have, I you know have another gonna view. have their theories yeah and i just got another corner yeah i'm just and another that's probably angle. what's really great about your book is that you know people can get it you mm -hmm. know they can read it um if they don't understand something they can read over it again do you know it's just something that we you know where you can just like really get in there mm -hmm. and understand what yeah. your theory is so yeah, yeah, I'm, not been... yeah I'm, I'm not trying to really like persuade mm -hmm. everybody you right know, like it's I... your theory and you want everybody to read about it <laughs> i'd can like we... them to know what i i've worked very hard on this for a very long time i'm I've been at this longer than the rest of you, and I have something to offer, I think. Absolutely. Yes. Well, we're excited. You know. Yeah, we're super excited. And we're going to share in, in the show notes, we'll share, you know, the, the link where people can go to, to uh, your website, buy the book. And we're going to see you. I'm sure you're going to, we're going to start. Oh, yeah. I hope, I hope yeah. somebody, we'll probably you know, see you. it's a new world for me. This It is yeah. a new world. Who knows? Maybe we could sell it, his book for him. Yeah. Like when well, we're at we'll the booth see. or something. Yeah. Yeah. We're, uh, it's a. Henry, it's it's been so awesome, Henry. Yeah. <laughs> it's we love having you on. Yeah, it's always oh, such a very, joy. Thank you very to much you. for having me. We appreciate me, you, guys. you. Thank, thank you, you so much, Henry. You. We're gonna talk Dana to you real Tim, soon. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for everything. Thank, yes. you. thank you. Thank you. Yes. Bye. Rest yes. in power. <laughs> All right. See you, Henry. <laughs> Oh my God, Henry is so fun. Yeah, he's great. Yeah, he is so fun, and 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 uh, and his theory is also amazing yeah i'm glad there wasn't a quiz because i would have been whew. well i mean was, no but i was into it's it it's hard it was, for it's, like yeah. normal people to understand yeah. a lot of what he's saying but you know i think what what's important is that um until we know we don't know and so we can't really discount anybody's theory um and uh it makes a lot of sense yeah, and I think if he, you can uh, get right. over like how we normally want to think about right. something, I think it does. And when he puts it in the book, it gives you a reference point to uh, to have it so you can read it and continue to read it if you don't understand it, which yep. um, probably be me. Or I'll call Henry and say, Henry, explain this to me. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, go to Henry's website. Uh, we'll share that in the show notes. Yep. Um, Pre-order the book. You know, he's already got, like he mentioned, he's already got some in, you know, in process of being printed. Yep. Um, I've already reserved my copy. So, um, and this is great. And, and, you know, best, uh, wishes to Peter Byrne, you know, so Peter yeah. was so, so am love, amazing to, yeah. to be part of my first book. And we, you know, I was able to have an interview with Peter and, uh, so best wishes, which is wish, wishes to Peter. Yep. We're and, wishing you a, 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 an easy transition, um, and lots of love. So thank you guys, uh, for joining us and, um, as always, yep. you know how to find us. We'll but, you see know. you at the next one. See you guys. <laughs>